Hi, I am uh, Peter Beal, and very excited to share with you um, a lecture series on the foundations of deep reinforcement learning, a domain I'm really, really excited about. And this video here is lecture one, in which we'll cover MDPs, mark of decision processes, and exact solution methods. Of course, this is part of the six lecture series. In lecture two, we'll look at deep Q learning, lecture three, policy gradients and advantage estimation, Lecture four, TRPO and PPO. Lecture five, DTBG and soft actor critic. And lecture six, we'll wrap it up with model-based RL. So I think between these six lectures will allow you to build a very strong foundation for understanding all the work that's going on in reinforced learning these days, as well as uh, maybe you know, do some of your own work. All right, so let's start with this first lecture here. Uh, we'll start with some motivation for the entire series. Why even care about DeepRL? What gets me so excited about DeepRL? From there, we'll look at the basic framework, mark of decision processes. And then we'll look at some ways of exactly solving MDP problems. You might wonder, well, if, if we can exactly solve them, why, why the rest of the lecture series after this first lecture? Well, it turns out the exact methods uh, while they provide a really good foundation for later also, they will not apply to the larger scale problems. So we'll see exact methods that work well for small scale MDPs and for large scale MDPs, we'll in future lectures see other methods that are applicable there, building on the foundations we learn here. And then uh, at the end of this lecture, we'll actually look at a formulation called maximum entropy formulation. And what that'll give us is yet more foundation for future lectures because maximum entropy is becoming one of the most popular formulations within RL. And as you'll see, it can, it can help with some basic exploration and robustness for our agents that might not be achieved with the more canonical uh, standard formulation. All right, so some motivation first. Um, I think, at least for me, the kind of excitement about deep reinforcement learning really started in 2013. What happened in 2013 was DeepMind showed that neural net agents through deep reinforcement learning can learn to play a wide range of Atari games. And this was a big breakthrough because until then, prior results in reinforcement learning had typically been on relatively uh, small toyish problems. And all of a sudden here, it was agents that can take in what's on the screen. So visual inputs, and actually you could run RL on different games and it would learn to play different games. So very exciting result. In parallel, actually, uh, with my lab at Berkeley, I had also already been working on deep reinforcement learning in the context of robotics and initially, especially in simulated robots. And what you'll see here on the right is a video of some highlights of the results in robotic learning. So it's all through reinforcement learning, the swimmer robot learned to swim the hopper robot learned to hop, and the 2D walker robot um, learned to run. And again, this is acquired not by somebody carefully programming the controls for these robots. This is by the robots doing trial and error learning, reinforcement learning. And actually here's what that looks like. In early iterations, the robots don't do so well, but they learn from those experiences and over time become better and better and better and master the skill that you might set them out to master. From there, another big result, this was in 2015, out of DeepMind was AlphaGo, showing that with the help of reinforcement learning, it was possible for a computer to beat the best human player, the human world champion at Go. This was a big result. Many people thought it would be many years before that would happen, and there it happened. Reinforcement learning was at the core of this. In parallel in my lab at Berkeley, we've been further pushing uh, what simulated robots can learn, going from 2D robots, what you saw in previous videos where they were in either a vertical plane or horizontal plane, now full 3D robots learning to run. So what we're gonna watch here when I start this video is we're gonna watch this robot learn. So we're gonna see reinforcement learning in action. Initially, it just falls over. And then it falls over a little later, which is better. And gradually over time, as it's iterating, uh, it gets better and better and better through trial and error learning, learning from its own experience. Now, the beauty is that the same piece of code then can be rerun 
on another robot, it can learn to run, let's say, a four-legged robot, or you can run it on the same robot for a new task, in this case, for learning to get up. And again, no specific programming is needed. The only thing you program is a reinforcement learning algorithm. And then the reinforcement learning algorithm is what essentially trains the robot and allows it to acquire these skills. And in fact, the same algorithm used here, this was TRPO plus generalized advantage estimation, which you'll fully understand uh, a few lectures down the line in this series, um, can actually also be run on the Atari games and it can learn to play Atari games. Then we actually also looked at how we can get this onto real robots. And what you see here is uh, Brett, the Berkeley robot for the elimination of tedious tasks. And Brett can learn to put the block into the matching opening. So um, what you see here, clicking through it, um, to accelerate this a bit, but this robot is practicing putting the block into the matching opening. And over time, through its own trial and error, Brett figures that out and is capable of inserting the block into the matching opening. Then actually the postdoc, Sergey Levin at the time in my lab who led the project with Brett and is actually now a professor at Berkeley himself, um, spent a year at Google where he was able to scale up this effort and ran similar reinforced learning algorithms on a whole group of robots. The beauty here is with robots, actually the more of them you have, the faster they can learn. Why is that? Well. The more robots you have, they can all share their data. And so, so they're all collecting data in parallel, learning, sharing that data. And what he showed is that you can actually do surprisingly well, by no means a solved problem, but you can do surprisingly well trial and error learning um, to learn to pick up objects. And that's what you see in action over here. In fact, quite a, a lot of robots training together. Then in 2017, OpenAI showed that the game of Dota 2, a very popular video game, an OpenAI bot beat the best humans one on one. And later actually did really well also in five on five. And so this shows that much more complex video games beyond Atari games can also be mastered with deep reinforcement learning. Here I'm highlighting some more work that we did at Berkeley where we now show that a very wide range of skills can be acquired by these simulated robots much any acrobatic motion they can learn through their own trial and error. And you can actually also do this for non-human-like robots. Here is a simulated lion that is running, and it's running through a policy that's learned through reinforcement learning. And of course, it's really nice because now when you have this kind of capability, if you, let's say, design a video game or you want to make a movie, instead of having to keyframe your lion for every spot along the way, you can just tell it go from point A to point B and it can figure out how to run from A to B. DeepMind in 2019 showed AlphaStar, which was a bot that learned to play the game of StarCraft, another one of the very, very popular video games, much more complex game again than Atari. And they were able to show they can do really well, close to top human level with a combination in this case of imitation learning and reinforcement learning. And then one of the other big highlights that maybe you've seen before, very exciting, is OpenAI showed it's possible through reinforcement learning for a robot to learn to solve a Rubik's Cube. So what you see here, I'm going to click forward through this because it's a pretty long video. This robot hand, after a lot of reinforcement learning, has learned how to solve a Rubik's Cube. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. After a couple of minutes, we see it's successfully solved this. These are just a few highlights. There's a lot more work that's happened in the space. And a lot more work is happening you know, every day. But this, I think, gives you a good sense of the kind of things that reinforcement learning has started to enable, which is really, really exciting because it's not just the final result that's so interesting here, which in and of itself is often very interesting, but also the fact that these agents, these robots, acquire those skills from their own trial and error learning. And so it shows that they have, in some sense, a, a very good learning capability that then might carry over to learn other tasks in the future. So at its core of all of this is reinforcement learning. And the framework reinforcement learning uses is the framework of market decision processes. So let's look at that framework and put a bit of formal structure behind all this on top of which 
we can then later build the algorithms that actually do the reinforcement learning. So our agent will be in an environment, gets to choose an action. After choosing that action, the environment will change. And then the agent gets to observe the changed environment, gets to choose an action again, and this process repeats over and over and over. And with the current situation of the environment, there is a reward associated with that, scoring how good that situation is. For example, maybe in a video game, the score of the video game could actually be the reward, or the incremental score you achieved in the last step could be the reward. Um, uh, if a robot is supposed to run, maybe the amount of forward progress made could be how the reward is measured and so forth. And the goal is for the agent to repeatedly interact with this environment and over time figure out the right action for each situation to maximize reward. We're making an assumption here in this framework that the agent gets to observe the state. There are extensions called POMDPs where the agent doesn't get to see the full state, but we'll, we'll focus on the, the straight up MDP setting at this time. So what does formally define an MDP? If you have a problem you wanna solve, if you can map it to an MDP, it means you can run a reinforced learning algorithm on it. But what does it mean to map it to an MDP? Well, there's a set of states. Then there's a set of actions the agent gets to choose from. There's a transition function that defines the probability of ending up in state S prime at the next time, given at the current time, this agent is in state S and took action A. There's a reward function that assigns reward for that transition. When you were in state S, took action A, landed in state S prime. There's a start state, or sometimes a start state distribution. If it's not always in the same state, things start. A discount factor gamma, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, but essentially it captures that things that are further in the future, we might care less about. We care more about getting reward today than getting reward, let's say, a year from now. And so the discounting says we should discount future rewards. One justification for that is let's say maybe your reward is money. If you had money today, you could invest it and it would become worth more if you invested it. Uh, or if you did a very simple investment, put it in the bank, it would earn interest. And you can think of this discount factor gamma as discounting future money, counting it for less value because if you only get it in the future, you cannot earn the interest on it in the intervening time. And then there's a horizon H, which says for how long we're going to be acting. So if you can map your problem onto this framework, then actually you can feed it to a reinforcement algorithm that can try to solve it for you. So the goal then, of course, for the reinforcement algorithm will be to find this policy that maximizes the expected discounted reward over time. So gamma to the power t says that things further in the future will be discounted more because the discount factor gamma will be something between zero and one, maybe 0 0.9 or 0 0.99. And so that signals that if you have 0 0.9, you roughly care about a horizon of 10. Uh, if you have a discount factor of 0 0.99, you roughly care about a horizon of 100. So it might depend on your problem setting what you want to use. We'll also later see that some algorithms might want to have gamma as a hyperparameter to help them function better. So what's an example of what fits this paradigm? A cleaning robot. Let's say if a cleaning robot, the state, what's the state? It's where everything is in your house as well as where the robot is. And then the actions is, well, the robot might be able to move somewhere um, or might be able to pick something up. The transition model describes if a robot takes a certain action, maybe move forward, what's the chance it actually moves forward? How far will it move forward? Or if it does a pickup, what you know will be the result and so forth? The reward function could be something, well, let's say it's a vacuum cleaning robot. It could be you get rewarded if dirt is removed from the floor. Or maybe you get rewarded based on whether all the objects are in the location they're supposed to be and everything's been organized. So you assign a reward to making progress on those tasks or having fully achieved those tasks. Gamma is the discount factor. Maybe with a cleaning robot, we care about a pretty long horizon, maybe 0 0.99 or 0 0.999. And then the horizon H is how many steps we're going to be considering. For your cleaning robot in your house, you might want it to be working well for several years. So you might have a horizon of, of several years. A walking robot. Maybe you're designing a walking robot, and then the state could be the configuration of all the joints of the robot, but not just the, 
the angle, the joint angles, but also the velocities, because the physical state is not just in pose, but also in derivative of pose. And then maybe it could also be things about the environment in the state, like the configuration of the ground in front of the robot, if the robot gets to observe that. Actions could be the motor torques applied to each of the motors. Uh, transition model captures the physical dynamics of, of this robot interacting with the world. The reward function would depend on what you want as a designer. If you want the robot to maybe stand still, you would give a reward for staying in place. If you want it to run, you might reward it for making forward progress. Again, you might pick a discount factor gamma based on over what horizon you kind of think that you can measure good behavior. You say, if I see the robot active for five seconds, that's indicative of how well it's doing, then maybe you have discount factor gamma that relates to that. So you're pull balancing. Uh, this is maybe not something you spend a lot of time thinking about in, in your daily life, unless you're an RL researcher, but can you balance a pole, maybe in the palm of your hand, or maybe that's sitting on a cart, which is a very common kind of task as a kind of basic test, a low dimensional problem that's often looked at. Games fall into this framework, maybe Tetris, Backgammon, Atari games, Go, and so forth. Server management, very different from the examples we've seen so far, but let's say you have a lot of requests coming into your servers. You want to manage where each request go. Maybe you're running a shopping site, or maybe you're running a server for compute jobs, and there's different researchers sending in compute jobs, and these jobs have different properties. And you want to see which job you want to prioritize onto which server, and then maybe your reward function relates to the throughput of jobs. And if you assign jobs to the right servers, maybe the throughput will be better than if you assign them to the wrong servers. But your reward function could also be something much harder to optimize for, but may maybe you want to try, such as, you know, the number of research breakthroughs coming out of your lab when you're running a specific server management policy. Shortest path problems are examples of market decision processes maps onto this whole framework. Often MDPs are also used as models for animals or people. So you might say, oh, maybe I'm building a self-driving car and now there's other people driving and I want to model them. And maybe I'll model them as behaving according to trying to optimize their own policy within their own MDP, and that could be an interesting way to capture what's happening around you. In fact, uh, there's some intuition there, right? Because probably other drivers are optimizing something. They're probably optimizing to get to their destination, to be safe. Maybe some other things that they might care about, uh, like cell phone coverage or a good view of where they're driving. So our MDPs are defined by the list here on the left. And we've seen quite a few examples, and you can probably come up with more examples of your own. And in some sense, if we have a working reinforcement learning algorithm implementation, that's kind of all you need to do. You just need to map your problem onto an MDP, and then you can run the RL algorithm, and hopefully it'll solve your problem. So in practice, unless you're doing research and development on the RL algorithm themselves, being able to define your problem as an MDP is really key, and then you run something. But in this course, of course, I want to introduce you to all the um, specifics and foundations of reinforcement learning algorithms. So we're going to not just define problems this way, we're going to now start understanding what they are and how we can start solving them. So we'll have a very canonical example throughout this lecture, which is grid world. Grid world is not something you probably uh, interact much with in the real world, but it's a really simple environment that allows us to build intuition about MDPs and reinforced learning algorithms. And also when you start running experiments of your own, it allows you to run experiments really, really fast because it's a very small problem formulation. So here's our grid world. What do we have? We have an agent and this agent is this little robot here. And the agent is currently in a square one comma three. So first row, third column. And from there, it can move to any of the neighboring squares. So the actions correspond to moving to a neighboring square. This here is a big rock blocking this square, so you cannot pass through this one. And then the rewards here, there's a plus one if you get to the diamond square on top, and there's a negative one if, uh, by mistake, you were to go into the fire pit over here. And here's a start state on the bottom left. There is effectively 11 locations the agent can be at. And clearly the goal is for the agent to move to that top right square and collect a plus one reward. 
formally, the goal is to maximize the expected discounted sum of rewards accumulated over time, and we want to find a policy that does that. Now, the dynamics of this world can vary. Um, you could set this up in a way where the actions are deterministically successful, or it could be that the actions are noisy. When the robot tries to move in a certain direction, there's a potential for another consequence maybe 80% chance success and 20% chance to randomly move off to the side instead of to the direction the robot wanted to move. And that allows us to also reason about stochastic environments, even within this simple, simple grid world. The beauty, of course, of this grid world is that you can pretty much eyeball the optimal solutions, and we'll do some of that very soon, which then in turn can give you intuition when you run an algorithm. Is it doing it right? Does it match with our intuition of what should be happening? So the goal is to end up with a policy that tells you what to do in this case, the policy shown at the bottom here might be a pretty good policy to maximize expected reward. Note that there's one subtle thing here with the discount factor. What it does is by having this discount factor that makes future rewards less valuable, you get the incentive to follow the shortest path to the square with the reward. Because if you don't follow the shortest path, you're wasting time, which means your future reward will be discounted more heavily and you won't get as much. All right, so we've seen the framework of MDPs. Let's look at a first solution method, value iteration, which will be a foundation for many things we'll see in the future. So what's the concept of a value function? A value function V star of S is the maximum we can achieve in expected discounted sum of rewards. So when we use the best possible policy that maximizes this, how much discounted sum of rewards are we gonna get? To be able to think about this value function, you have to think about what is the optimal strategy and what will it get us. So let's go to our grid world example. So agents in our grid world, it can move in any of four directions, of course, not down where it is right now because that's up against the, the boundary. And then if it lands in the minus one square, it gets minus one and everything's over. It lands in the plus one, it gets a plus one reward, everything's over. So let's now think about this. Assuming everything is deterministically successful, our discount factor gamma is 1, so no discounting is happening effectively. Horizon is 100, so we have 100 steps for our agent. The agent starts in the 4, 3 square, which is up here. Well, then I'll right away collect that reward of 1 and be done. So that's easy. That's the best it can do. Then what if it starts in 3, 3 over here? The best it can do is move to the right, collect that reward, and then it's done. And since there's no discounting, and all it takes one step, um, so it's within the horizon of 100, easily achievable, no discounting, so that reward of one really is worth one, and we also have a value of one here. How about two, three over here? Well, it'll take two steps to get to the plus one reward, but there's no discounting, so it'll still be a value of one. How about starting at one, one? Well, I'll take one, two, three, four, five steps to then collect that reward, but there's no discounting, so still optimal value is one. How about if it starts in 4, 2? Well, over here it's trapped in the fire pit and it'll get the reward of negative 1. And so the optimal value here is not great, but that's just what it is. When you're there, the optimal value happens to be negative 1 because you have no options in life. When you're here, you're just in the fire pit getting a negative 1. Okay, let's make this a little more complicated. What if you have a discount factor gamma of 0 0.9 and actions are still deterministically successful? And let's say we start over here, 4, 3. Well, what happens? We grab the diamond once we're there. That's our action. We get a plus one reward, and it's done. That happens right away. So there's no discounting yet. We get a value of one. What if we now start in the 3, 3 square next to it? We first have to step towards the square with the diamond, and then the next action is to get the plus one reward. So it's one delayed. So we have a discount of 0 0.9 and that's the best we can do, so the value is 0 0.9. How about starting in 2, 3? Now it takes two steps, so we're discounting twice. 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times the 1 is 0 0.81. What if we start in the 1, 1 square? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 steps before we can grab the, the diamond to get the reward, so that's discounting 0 0.9 to the power of 5, and so the optimal value starting in 1, 1, is 0 0.59. And then how about if we start in 4.2, the fire pit again? Well, that's, that's, that's not where we want to start, obviously. 
there's nothing we can do there except for essentially the agent uh, is stuck in the fire, it gets a reward of negative one. Now let's make it even more complicated. Now the action success probability goes down to 0 0.8. So when the agent, for example, where it is right now, wants to go up, there's an 80% chance it will land in the square above it, but a 10% chance it'll veer off to the right, 10% chance it'll veer off to the left. So the dynamics is more complex now. Discount factor is still 0 0.9 and horizon 100. So plenty of time. What if we start the square with the diamond? Here, there is no navigation action. It's just a grabbing action, which actually always succeeds. So we just get the reward of one right away. What if we start next to it? Well, if we start next to it, we want to move towards the diamond and then grab it. And so that would be, we'll get the diamond one step later, 0 0.9 times one is what we'd have. That only happens if our action moving to the right was successful. And that happens with 80% chance. So with 80% chance, so 0 0.8 times this can fact 0 0.9, we get then the value of being in the square of 4 or 3, which is 1. But we also have a 0 0.1 chance when we try to move to the right that we actually end up moving down instead or move up, but up bounces against the walls to, to stay in place. So 0 0.1 chance of land staying in place in the 3, 3. So we have 0 0.1 chance of staying in place where we'll get the value of square 3, 3, but it's discounted by 0 0.9 because the value of square 3, 3 will only start getting one step later. And then same if we were to move down the value of square, square 3, 2. And so something interesting is happening here. To know the value of the square 3, 3, we actually get something recursive in terms of the values of the neighboring squares. So you'll again have to compute it in terms of values of the neighboring squares that you might transition into. This is a general principle here that we're going to explore that's called value iteration. So simplest is the initialization of our value function. We're going to have now value functions, not just V star, but V star indexed also by how many time steps are still in the future. And let's say there are zero time steps in the future for us. There's nothing left. Well, then the value is zero, obviously, because there's nothing left. And so we can initialize the values for all states as zero for when there is zero time steps left to go. Then when there's one time step left to go, that's the optimal value for the state when we have one time step, V1 star S. Well, how do we get that? Well. We look at all actions available in that state and then sum over all future states, the probability of landing in that future state S prime, given we're currently in state S, took action A, then we multiply with the reward we get from that transition plus a discount factor, the value we'll be getting from then onwards, then onwards has zero time steps left. So V zero star S, which is actually gonna be a zero. This is really the key idea behind value iteration, is that you decompose the problem of having a certain number of time steps left into the immediate thing and one less time step left. Same thing happens for two time steps left. What is the optimal value for state S when the horizon is two? Well, we look at all possible actions available to us and for each action we check. What is the expected reward we would get right away? So average reward, average by the probability of going to that state S prime and also averaged what we'll get in the future, weighted by the transition dynamics. And in this case, what we'll get in the future, of course, is again discounted, and it's with one time step left. Then same for k time steps, you have a general iteration here. It says, what is the value for being in state S with k time steps left? Well, it's the best action we can take at that time as measured by the distribution over possible states we weigh by the probability of landing in a future state S prime, the reward from the transition, as well as the value we would get in that next state, discounted by gamma with k minus one steps left. Thinking back to the previous slide here, that iteration effectively what we were writing down here, we're writing down how the value at state three, three is what you get immediately. In this case, immediately the reward is zero. And then the distribution of what you get also in the future, depending on which state, you land in. Okay, 
So now let's take a look at the full algorithm. We start with setting the value function, which is just some kind of array or, or vector equal to zero for when there's zero time steps left for all states. Then we're going to iterate. If we have a total horizon of h, then we're going to have to iterate h times. For each horizon, we essentially work our way from zero time steps left, one time steps left, and so forth. We're going to have to look at all states. And for every state, we're going to have to compute this maximum. The exact equation we've been seeing on the previous slide. Find the best action by looking for each action. What is the expected immediate reward plus expected future value from the state you land in? And we might as well also catalog what the action is that is prescribed by all this. And then the result is that as we run these validates or Bellman updates or Bellman backups, we get the optimal value for every state for anywhere from zero through h time steps to go. Let's take a look at this in action. Okay, zero iterations in. Well, all the values are zero. Now we will iterate through all states to find v1 of s. What do you think we're going to see? Well, when there's one time step to go, we know for at the diamond state we'll be able to grab that reward of one. If we're in the fire pit state, we will end up having to eat the fire effectively and get a reward of negative one. And so when k goes to one, we expect a one on the top right, then a minus one below it. And how about all the other states? They'll remain zero because within one time step, there's no reward to be accumulated. So we apply this equation to all of those states and here's the result. Then we can go again. What if we're curious about V2? We have k equal one shown below. V2 will do one iteration on top of that. Well, what do we expect? Well, the square neighboring to the plus one square will become non-zero because we'll be able to transition into that and then at the next time get the value of that top right square. How about next to the fire pit? Will that go to non-zero? Well, the optimal action would be not to move into the fire pit. And so the optimal action will actually be able to keep this value at zero by explicitly avoiding the fire pit. So this will actually stay zero. Indeed, what we see here. How we get to 0 0.72? Well, we had an 80% chance of successfully moving to the right. If we move to the right, we'll get a value of one, but it's discounted by 0 0.9. So we have 0 0.9 value by getting there times the 0.8 probability of success of moving there. And so as we move this to the iterations, what we see is this kind of fanning out of the value from where the good values are to states that can reach these good states with reward. And so as this iterates over time, we see that all these states start getting non-zero values. And reflecting that now in nine time steps, you can actually get to the plus one reward with a pretty high chance and get the corresponding discounted value. And as we keep iterating this, we'll see actually that at some point, these things stop changing. So you see, going back here, 10, 11, 12, not much change to 100. No change from 10, at least with two digits behind the point. And so what we see here is a convergence behavior. And this is actually quite typical for value iteration. If you run it for long enough, it'll converge. And you get what is a stationary optimal policy, as well as the effectively infinite horizon value is shown to you. Even though you didn't run it for infinitely many iterations, it converges to that or very close to that much uh, sooner. And actually, the speed of conversions often relates to the discount factor. The closer your discount factor is to zero, the faster things will converge. The closer it is to one, the longer it might take for things to converge. Okay, so here's a theorem behind that. Value iteration converges. At convergence, we have found the optimal value function V star for the discounted infinite horizon problem, which satisfies the Bellman equation. So at convergence, we have the solution to this equation. Now, so we know how to act for infinite horizon with discounted rewards, which is nice. You just run value iteration till convergence and this produces V star. And then once we have V star, we can extract the optimal action using the Bellman equation yet one more time, or we might have just stored the optimal action from our Bellman updates during running the algorithm. Note that the infinite horizon policy is stationary. That is the optimal action at a state S is the same action at all times. So it's very efficient to store. 
we don't need to store an action for each state for each time. It's just sufficient to store an action for each state, which is really convenient. And that will be our policy that prescribes for each state the optimal action pi star. Okay, what's the intuition behind this convergence? Why do we know this is going to converge, not just in this example in the grid world, but more generally? Well, V star of S is the expected sum of rewards accumulated starting from state S, if you act optimally for infinitely many steps. Okay. V H star of S is the expected sum of rewards accumulated starting from state S, acting optimally for H steps. The additional reward that's collected over time steps h plus one, h plus two, and so forth, we can write out what that is. It's gamma to the power h plus one, because it's discounted what you get at time h plus one, times the reward at time h plus one. Then gamma to the power h plus two times the reward at time h plus two for being in state as h plus two, and so forth. This is a geometric series. We can bound this from above. And so this is smaller than gamma to the power h plus one, divided by one minus gamma times the maximum reward you can possibly get anywhere. Well, we look at this, this quantity, R max over one minus gamma is fixed, will not change as we change our horizon H. But as we increase our horizon, that is the number of iterations we run our value iteration algorithm, this gamma to the H plus one at the top, gamma is below one. So that will keep shrinking. And so the difference between optimal value V star for infinite horizon and optimal value V star H for finite horizon H is bounded as H becomes larger by a smaller and smaller and smaller number. And that's why this is going to converge. As H becomes large enough, the optimal value become very, very close to V star of S. So this goes to zero, this goes to infinity. And that's exactly what we just talked about. For simplicity of notation, I just assume that all the rewards are positive here. If some rewards could be negative, then you kind of have to redo the same derivation where you use the absolute value of rewards rather than just rewards. And it's the maximum absolute value of reward that will be in this equation rather than just the maximum reward. All right. Now, there's another way that people have shown value iteration converges uh, through contractions. And this is a mechanism that sometimes can be helpful in proving other things. So let me give you just the, the main intuition here. The idea here is that we're first going to define a norm. In this case, the max norm. So the max norm of a vector is the maximum absolute value among all entries in that vector. An update operation is a gamma contraction in the max norm, even only if, if we have two vectors, ui and vi, and then we apply an update to both of them, becoming ui plus one and vi plus one, that those updated vectors, ui plus one and vi plus one, are closer together by a factor gamma than the original vectors ui and vi. There's a theorem that says a contraction converges to a unique fixed point, no matter the initialization. Why would that be the case? Intuitively, essentially, no matter where you start, no matter which two vectors you look at that you could have started from, they get pulled closer together over time. And if they always get pulled closer and closer together, and that's true for all pairs, they must end up all in the same point. Fact, the value iteration update is a gamma contraction in the max norm, meaning that when we do a Bellman update and we have two different starting points for our update, two different value functions we start from, we do a one-step update, they will be brought closer together, which means then because it's a contraction, uh, if we do this long enough, it'll actually converge no matter where we started from to the optimal value function. So converge to a unique fixed point. And there's an additional fact, as you go along, you can actually even bound the error that is still there by looking at the size of the update. If your update is small, it actually means that also in the future, only small changes can happen because it tends to be changes that propagate throughout the space. And so you can have a bound on your error, even for finite number of iterations. So once the update is small, we're close to conversion. So sometimes you can run it that way. Instead of saying, I'm going to run this many iterations, you can say, I'm going to run it till the update is small enough, which means I'm close enough to the optimum and I'll uh, abort my value iteration. All right. So 
that was some theory. Now let's take a look at what some of the environment parameters do to the optimal policy. So here we again have a grid world. Agent starts in the yellow square and it can again move up, down, left, right. We have a bunch of fire pits here, valid fire pits, rewards of negative 10 if you land in there. Then there's a reward of one over here, which is somewhat close by, and a reward of plus 10 over there. And keep in mind, once you land in a reward square, the way the environment works is at that point, it, episode is over. So if you go to the one, you'll get the one and it's over. You cannot later also go to the 10. Uh, so whichever non-zero reward square you're on, that's where you end up and it's over once uh, you collected that reward. So now let's think about it. What if we want the agent to prefer the close exit, the plus one, while being okay with risking the cliff? So maybe along the bottom, go to the plus one. What choice do you think we need to make for gamma, the discount factor, and for the noise on the dynamics? There's four different choices here. What if we want the agent to prefer to close exit, the plus one, so close again, but avoid the cliff. So go the roundabout way to the plus one. When would that be optimal? What kind of discount factor would favor that? What kind of noise would favor that? What if we prefer the distant exit, the plus 10, while risking the cliff? So we want to go along the bottom and keep going along the bottom all the way till we reach the plus 10. And what if we want to go to the distant exit, but take no risk, go along the top? So there's a little exercise for you to think about. So there are four different agent behaviors that we might want to get out. And what I'm telling you is that actually in this grid world in MDP, by choosing the discount factor gamma in a specific way and choosing the noise on the dynamics, the probability of success of the action, and when it's not successful, it'll veer off to the left or the right from the direction it wanted to move. By choosing that noise factor and the discount factor in a specific way, different behaviors will be optimal. And I've given you four choices here for discount factor and noise. I've given you four scenarios here for what I'm would like to get out as optimal policies, how do they match up? And just to be clear, they don't match up line by line. The exercise is to figure out for A, is it one, two, three, or four that will result in A? For B, is it one, two, three, or four that will result in B? I to give it some thought. Okay, so. If we want the agent to prefer the close exit plus one while risking the cliff, so going along the bottom, we need a discount factor gamma of 0 0.1 and noise zero. Noise zero, that should be easy to understand because noise zero means that actually, even though we say risking the cliff, there's no risk of being errantly going into the cliff because there's zero chance of your action not being successful. So you can safely navigate close to the cliff because there's no noise. And then how do we ensure the agent prefers to exit with the one instead of keep going to go to the 10? Well, we need to make sure we discount enough. The 10 takes two extra steps to get to. So we need to make sure the discount factor is such that two extra steps makes it so much discounted, it's not worth that much anymore. But the discount factor of 0 0.1, those two extra steps will cost us 0 0.1 to the power two so 0 0.01 multiplied into 10, that 10 will only be worth 0 0.1 if it comes two steps later. And so we prefer a one now over a 10 two time steps later. What if we wanted to prefer to close exit still while avoiding the cliff? Well, if we introduce noise, well then the agent, if it goes along the bottom, it would likely drop into the fire pits and get very negative rewards. So the optimal policy would be to go around of be far away from the fire pits. And then since our discount factor is still 0 0.1, since we take two extra steps to get to the 10 compared to the one, the discounting of that two extra steps is 0 0.1 to the power two. It's not a good choice to keep going for those two extra steps to get the 10. You wanna just get to the one where you can get to sooner. If we prefer the distant exit, which is a plus 10, while risking the cliff, well, if we make things deterministic again, no noise, it's not really a big risk to run along the cliff because you're now going to fall into it. And the discount factor 0 
means that the discounting of the two extra steps is 0 0.99 to the power of two, which is almost no discounting for those two extra steps. And so we're definitely gonna favor taking two extra steps to get to the 10 over two steps sooner getting the one. What if we want the distant exit and avoid the cliff? Well, then we introduce noise again. When there is noise and the agent is not guaranteed to be successful in its actions, well, it shouldn't be close to the fire pit, it's dangerous. It will wanna run around along the top. It's willing to take the extra two steps to get to the far away 10 because 0 0.99 is very little discounting. So it's worth the extra two steps to get to 10. All right, now we've seen value of states. Turns out there's another concept, which is Q values, and they'll be important too. They're very related. Q star, or a state as an action A, is the expected discounted sum of rewards if you start in state S, take action A, and thereafter act optimally. So it's essentially, it's like a value, but not for a state, but for being in a state and having committed to a specific action in that state. We'll call those Q values. Okay. We can actually have a Bellman equation for Q values also. And some of the algorithms that we'll later see will use this Q value Bellman equation. What is the optimal Q value? For being stated as action A, what is the optimal value? Well, what happens after we committed to that action? We'll have a transition to the next state S prime. So we need to see, okay, what's the distribution of our next state S prime? What's the reward we get for that transition, which is here? So the first term here measures expected reward on the immediate transition. And then the second term here measures expected value at the future state S prime. This here really is V star of S prime, but now expressed with Q values. What is V star of S prime? It's the best you can do from state S prime. Well, so that means we need to pick the optimal action A prime in that state S prime. So I'll stare at this just a little longer because this is one of the most important concepts, the Q value iteration equation. Q value is expected sum of rewards plus expected future Q value, which of course is discounted because it's one step in the future. So Q value iterations is the same thing as value iteration, but with Q values, you now have Q sub index by K and K plus one and exact same equation iterating through these Bellman updates to start from an initialization of Q values, which could be all zeros for Q zero star. And then from there, work our way up to Q H for whatever horizon we want. And of course, for the same reason, value iteration converges with V values. It also converges with Q values. And so we can get a optimal Q value for infinite horizon that we can then use for our agent. Okay, so what does it look like on this kind of environment after a hundred iterations? The important thing I wanna point out here is that well, in these navigation squares, we now see four values because each of the four actions has a different value. For example, here, the square next to the diamond square where we'll exit with a reward of one, when we take the action to the right, we have a high success of landing into that square with the reward and so there's a high value. When we go up, well, can't really move up, we stay in place, we actually wasted a cycle. When we move to the right, we waste more cycles, we've got to work our way back. We move down, we not only waste a cycle, but we also risk maybe with a noisy action ending up in the fire pit later, so that's even worse. So you can read off from these Q values, what is the right action to take? And that's one of the nice things about Q values. As you end up with your Q values, you can read off uh, the optimal action in each state by seeing which one achieves the highest Q value. Okay, so at this point, we have covered value iteration. In fact, two types of value iteration based on V values and based on Q values. Both will be important and they already allow us to solve small MDPs. We can loop through all the states and actions repeatedly. We can solve them this way. So if you have a small MDP, you can just implement this value iteration thing. And there you are, you get optimal values for the infinite horizon problem, optimal policy, and you can then deploy that policy and have your agent do really well in your environment. There's actually another method. And since we already know how to solve small scale MDPs with what we saw so far by iterating over all states and actions. You might wonder, well, why do we still need another method? It turns out that some of the approximate methods we'll see later, some of them will build directly on the value iteration approach. Others will build directly on the policy iteration approach. And so it's good to understand both because 
the methods that we'll see in the future, there's different methods that are relevant for different kinds of situations. And so we'll want to have both foundations. Okay, how does policy iteration operate? The first step is policy evaluation. In policy evaluation, what you do is you say, I'm going to, well, I'll start from value iteration to ground this. So this is what we had in value iteration. In policy evaluation, we fix the policy. So we don't get the max of our actions. We're going to fix the policy. And then we can do something similar. The same equation, but there's no max anymore. Once we fix the policy, we can run value iteration for that fixed policy. And that's called policy evaluation. Now, over time, give us the values for a different number of time steps left for that policy pi. So if somebody gives you a policy, you run this policy evaluation sequence of uh, updates. At convergence, we'll find the value for that specific policy for each state for infinite horizon. You might wonder, how do we know this is going to converge? Well, it's just a special case of value iteration because you're running value iteration update equations. Just the max uh, is very restricted. You don't get to choose, but that doesn't fundamentally change things in terms of convergence. All right, so let's do another exercise here to familiarize ourselves a bit more with policy evaluation. And let's now consider a stochastic policy. Pi A given S is the probability of taking action A instead S. Which of the following is the correct update to perform policy evaluation for this stochastic policy? Is it question one, two, or three? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Okay, let's take a look at this. So first equation, we have a max over actions, but we know that in policy evaluation, the policy chooses the action. So if we're given the updates, the freedom to choose the action, we might end up with actions that are not matched with the policy we're prescribed to evaluate. So this is not going to work. Second one, value for, going for k plus one steps, we land a status prime with sum over possible actions as described by the probability of taking that action here, probability of landing in the next status prime, and times reward for that transition, plus the value when we use that policy with k steps left in the next status prime. Well, this looks right to me, because this is exactly what we have in our value iteration equations, except that the action cannot be chosen with a max. It's done based on what the policy probabilistically prescribes, and there's a corresponding averaging happening here. This is it. Equation two is the answer. This is how we compute the value of a stochastic policy. How about equation three? Um, well, that's not right, because you cannot choose your next state as prime. And so when we compute values here, it assumes that part of the process that we get to choose our next state as prime, but that's not available. We only get to you know, act according to the policy not choose next states directly. So again, three is wrong, only two is a correct answer. All right, so now we know how to do policy evaluation, both for deterministic policies and stochastic policies. Now we can build an algorithm around this. We can, at a high level, have an algorithm where we have a policy we start with, we evaluate it, and after we evaluated it, we'll use that evaluation to make an improvement to the policy. Then we'll evaluate the new policy, use that evaluation to make an improvement again. And that's called policy iteration. What does one of these iterations look like? So we first evaluate the current policy pi k, and then we'll improve. Evaluation we've already seen. You essentially repeat those value iteration equations, but without a max, you have to follow the action the policy prescribes. Can't take the max, but other than that, this is just value iteration type updates. You find the values of each state when using that policy, and then we can make an improvement. Find the best action by looking one step ahead. Here's the idea. The new policy looks at what is essentially, again, a value iteration update, where again, we get to max over actions actually now, and we store whatever action is the best action we store in pi k plus one of us. Let's look at this a bit more closely. What we're doing here 
we're looking at the action in state S that maximizes averaged over future states S prime. If we were to take that action A, the reward we get immediately, and then the discounted future value we get if we were to follow our current policy pi k, which we just evaluated in the other step. So you get to choose your first step, and after that, you're going to use the policy pi k because we know the value of each state for policy pi k, so we can use that to evaluate the future. All right, and then we go back. We evaluate now this policy pi k plus 1, improve upon that with a one-step look-ahead approach, and keep repeating. And over time, this will actually converge. At convergence, we'll actually find the optimal policy. And it actually often converges in less overall iterations than value iteration. But of course, it's a trade-off because inside this big iteration here, there are smaller iterations happening here that are like value iteration. And so even though the overall outer iterations might be less, there is more work on the inside. And so there are some trade-offs involved. OK. Now, I want to give you a little bit of extra intuition of why we have these guarantees. So here, repeating the policy iteration algorithm is policy evaluation followed by policy improvement, which is done by one step look ahead. And I told you there's a theorem that guarantees this converges. And that converges, you find the optimal policy and the optimal value function. What's the intuition for this? Here's a proof sketch. First of all, I'm going to tell you why it's guaranteed to converge. Then I'm going to tell you why it's optimal once it's converged. So why is this guaranteed to converge? Well, in every step, the policy improves. This means that a given policy can be encountered at most once. Because if you're improving and improving and improving, well, the next policy cannot be a previous one because the next one is better. This means that after we've iterated as many times as there are different policies, which you can bound in a finite environment, there's only so many policies, we must be done and have converged. Well, we now know that we're converging. This hinges on one little thing is that in every step, the policy improves. What's the intuition behind that? When you do this one step look ahead, you're choosing an action that is the best action. So you're choosing the best action right now if you later apply the existing policy. Well, by taking the best action now followed by later the current policy, that's better than just applying the current policy right now followed by the current policy. So you are improving your action in that first step. Now, the new policy that you're using will actually do this in every step. It'll then in the next step, again, do the same thing. It'll say in this new state I'm in, I'm going to look one step ahead. And by doing that every step, you're actually doing even better than a one step improvement. And so it's not just that you have a one step improvement, you actually have a beyond one step improvement under the hood when you get your new policy pi k plus one. Now, why are we optimal at convergence? Well, by definition of convergence, pi k plus one must be equal to pi k for all states. This means that when we compute pi k plus one, it's equal to pi k, meaning that the argmax is equal to what pi k already prescribes. But we know that's the value iteration equation. In value iteration, when we have convergence, we're at the optimum. And so same thing here with policy iteration. We improve the policy. When we have convergence, we satisfy the Bellman equation, the value iteration equation, and we're at the optimal value function V star. All right, a little bit of a theoretical aside, but hopefully it helps you build a bit more intuition for this algorithm. So at this point, we've covered two methods to solve MDPs, value iteration and policy iteration. And these will be the foundation for many of the algorithms we'll see in the later lectures to solve larger scale problems. But before we go to that, I want to introduce to you also another formulation for solving MDPs, or for at least framing MDPs, which is the maximum entropy formulation. And as you'll see, many of the algorithms we'll see in the future actually will borrow uh, ideas from this. So. The question we're asking here is, what if we could find a distribution over near optimal solutions? So instead of finding the single optimal policy, what if instead we try to find a distribution over possible behaviors 
that are all pretty good or put higher probability on good behaviors, lower probability on not so good behaviors. Can we do that? Well, we'll momentarily see how to do that. But let's first think about what would that give us if we have such a distribution? First of all, it gives us a more robust policy effectively because by having this distribution over possible behaviors, if now we deploy a policy and something changed in the world, we can rely on other things in the distribution. Maybe the optimal policy, somehow the path is blocked, but because of the distribution over solutions, we can you know, rely on one of the others and still do quite well. Another thing it could give us is more robust learning. And this is a little subtle for now maybe, but at the high level essentially, for now we've looked at solution methods where we directly solve MDPs. And that's possible in these smaller scale problems. But in the future, larger scale problems we're gonna solve, there will be an iterative process where learning happens, interleaving of data collection in the world with improving a policy or a value function, collecting more data, improving the policy value function and so forth. And so as we go that data collection process, well, how do we collect data? Well, a typical thing is to use current policy to collect data. But if your policy is very deterministic, highly optimized, then the data collection might not be as interesting. And so by looking at the maximum entropy approach, we'll end up with policies that introduce more variation in how the data is collected, which can provide better exploration, which can lead us to find better optima in the long run as we're training these policies. Okay, so. What is entropy? Entropy is a measure of uncertainty over a random variable X, let's say. It's the number of bits required to encode it. If you go to information theory, it's, it's a very precise measure of what it takes to encode a random variable X on average. So mathematically, the entropy of a random variable X with a distribution P is the sum over all values X, I, this random variable can take on, the probability it takes on that value, so it's a weighted sum, times the two log, as we're gonna be measuring in bits in this case, though it's just a scale factor, of course, if you use a natural log. And so intuitively what's going on here, but I don't wanna dive into too much information theory, you can think of this as, if I have a distribution over values my random variable can take on, if I wanna encode it, values that are very likely, I'm gonna encode with a small number of bits. And values that are less likely, I'm gonna use more bits for. Well, why, why even use more bits? Because of course I need to distinctly encode them. I cannot use you know, the same encoding for different values because then I cannot distinguish. So I need, let's say if my variable XI can take on 10 different values, I'll need 10 different bit sequences to be able to transmit that variable. One different bit sequence for each value from one through 10, let's say. And so instead of uniformly assigning bit sequences, I might assign a very short bit sequence to a value that's very likely and then a longer one the value that's less likely. And it turns out that the way this you know, optimally can be done is that you end up with essentially a number of bits log two of one over PXI for each value XI. Okay, so let's look at some examples. If we have a binary random variable, X that can take on two values, zero or one, let's say, and we look at the probability of X being equal to one, which is a number between zero and one, and we look at the entropy of the distribution, it peaks at a half, because that's where there's maximum uncertainty about what the value is going to be. Let's look at some other examples. Here are two histograms. Which of these two histograms do you think is a higher entropy? Um, one on the left or the one on the right? Well, the one on the left has a higher entropy. Why is that? Well, entropy measures the amount of uncertainty over what value the random variable is gonna take on. The one on the right, there's not much uncertainty. It's almost always gonna be this first value. Whereas the one on the left, well, there's a lot of uncertainty about which value it might take on. More mathematically, you can compute this. The entropy for the distribution on the left, which is 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, 0 0.125, is this equation over here, which is 2.25, calculated for one on the right, 1.3. So on the left has almost twice the entropy compared to the one on the right. So now that we understand a little bit about entropy, it's this thing that measures how much, in some sense, variance or uncertainty there is in the outcome of a, a sample from a distribution, we can now start bringing it into MDPs. So let's say we have a regular MDP. We try to maximize expected sum of rewards. 
What does a maximum entropy MDP do? Well, instead of maximizing just the sum of rewards, and by the way, you can also discount this, but I left the discounting out here for just simplifying the equations a bit, uh, less symbols for us to stare at, it adds an extra term. What is this extra term? It's looking at the entropy of the policy. So the policy describes the action to take in each state. But of course, if we make the policy deterministic, that entropy will be zero, and that's a very low entropy, it's the lowest possible entropy. We're not going to want that. So we now have a policy that describes a distribution over actions in each state. And what this says is that in maximum entropy MDPs, we're not just maximizing reward, we're also with a trade of factor beta, maximizing the entropy of the policy in each state encountered. Now, there will be a trade-off, of course, because the more you can control your actions, the more precisely you can control what your agent achieves and the reward it's going to get. And so the larger we make beta, the more we optimize our entropy, likely the less reward we're going to be collecting, and vice versa. The smaller we make beta, in the limit, if we make beta equal to zero, we'll be able to collect more rewards because we don't have to worry about entropy. So at first you might say, why even bother if this is gonna be a trade-off on performance? But that kind of goes back to what I said earlier and let me pull that slide back up. Even though it looks like a trade-off, when you're actually training with some of these more advanced algorithms, the learning will often be more robust if you have entropy in your objective. Because for a longer time, the policy will stay more stochastic and which will lead to exploratory data collection and better trial and error learning. Another reason you might care is that you could end up with a more robust policy if the environment changes. You'll have other things the policy knows to do rather than that one action for each state. Okay, so these are all good reasons to care about this. But now the question is, can we also solve this kind of MDP? To do this, we actually need to make a little side sidetrack. Um, instead of right away solving this MDP the way we've done for regular MDPs with value iteration, we're going to do something called max n value iteration, but we need to first look at constraint optimization. So in constraint optimization, obviously, I mean, you can take an entire course in constraint optimization. I'm going to cover this here in <laughs> literally a, a couple of minutes. So if you haven't seen constraint optimization before, this might move a bit fast. But if you've seen it before, hopefully this is a good refresher. If you've not seen it before, hopefully at least it gives you some of the intuition. In constraint optimization, we're maximizing some objective subject to a constraint. So we have a function f of x we maximize while g of x has to be equal to zero, which limits our choices of x. Not every x is a valid choice. We can only choose x's where g of x is equal to zero. And among those x's where g of x is equal to zero, we want the one that maximizes f of x. Okay. There's a concept called Lagrangian, which is often used, where we maximize x still. And then instead of putting f of x on the inside, on the inside, we put f of x plus lambda g of x. So we're now going to do a max min. You might say, wow, we start with a max with a constraint. Now we have a max min. Turns out it'll help us. So we now solve a max min problem for f of x plus lambda g of x. And I'm not deriving this here, but there is a resulting constraint optimization that says that at the optimum of this original problem, the derivative or the gradient, if it's a you know, multidimensional x, of the Lagrangian script L with respect to x is equal to zero. The gradient with respect to lambda, if there's multiple lambdas, or the derivative with respect to lambda, there's one lambda, is also equal to zero. Okay. So to solve the original problem, we form this Lagrangian and then we can find a solution by setting these two derivatives equal to zero and solving for x and lambda that make this zero. It gives us a solution to the original problem. It gives us the x we want. In addition, also gives us a lambda in the process. Okay. Now, I'm not going to step in great detail to the math here, but we can actually do this for max. And what I show on the slides here is for a one-step problem. In a one-step problem, we maximize the expected reward in that one step when we use a policy, which is distribution over possible actions, plus beta times entropy. So we don't want to just pick the action that maximizes reward because we also want high entropy. So our result there will be a distribution over actions, a policy pi of A, which assigns non-zero probability to all actions, a bit more probability to the optimal action, but also non-zero probability to the others to have a good entropy. 
So this is the problem here. Now, pi of a is a vector with entries between 0 and 1 for each possible action. So this is our objective here. Now, pi of a cannot take on any values. The entries need to sum to 1 because it's a probability distribution. So we form a Lagrangian. We have, this is our Lagrangian now, set to with respect to our x variable, which is pi of a, and respect to our lambda equal to 0. Work through some math. We get that our optimal maxim policy pi a is equal to 1 over a normalization constant, z. So let's forget about z for now. It's equal to exp 1 over beta r of a. So let's also ignore beta for now. Let's assume it's equal to 1. Then we're saying the probability of taking an action is the exponentiated reward associated with that action. So actions with high reward will have higher probability. Actions with low reward or negative reward will have lower probability. Now, of course, the probability has to sum to 1. And that's why we have the 1 over z over here, which is the normalization constant. So solution to this original problem does kind of what we want. This max n formulation results in assigning higher probability to actions that have higher reward, lower probability to actions with lower reward. And the extent to which we do this depends on beta. So if our variable beta, which is a trade-off between entropy and reward, if we make beta very, very high, we really favor entropy, then this beta here will be very, very high. And the larger we make beta, it'll shrink effectively the rewards that we have here, bring them all closer to zero, make it more uniform how much reward we're exponentiating. And as a consequence, all the actions will have a similar probability. And the other limit, if beta goes to zero, we don't care about entropy, then this here will be dividing by a number close to zero, not exactly zero, but a very small number that will scale up the rewards, push everything further apart. High rewards will be further away from medium rewards, further away from small rewards, and we'll get heavy favoring of the high reward actions. Now, this is the optimal policy. What is the optimal value? Well, we can fill this back in, compute the optimal value. We see that the optimal value is the log Let's ignore beta for now. So let's assume beta is 1, the log of the sum over actions exponentiated reward of each action. So this is a soft max, actually. It's saying the value under this max end value iteration problem is the soft max of the values rather than just picking the direct max. And how sharp we take the soft max depends on beta. A beta close to infinity favors entropy. It means we take a very soft soft max. And beta going closer to 0 makes this into a very sharp soft max. And so it's very intuitive in some way. When we think about value iteration, we take maxes. We think about max and value iteration, we'll be taking soft maxes. And how soft depends on the temperature parameter beta that we choose. And so max and value iteration, we had it for one step before. Now let's look at what we have for multi-step. We have this overall objective on the left. One step update, we'll look at this here, right? The immediate reward plus plus entropy, but then also we need to look at future rewards. We have the decomposition here with VK minus one, one less step to go. This is the new Bellman equation, the max ent Bellman equation right over here. Um, well, let's see, reward plus then value that we can call Q. And then the other part is the entropy. And then if we look at this, well, we actually have the same problem as we had before. If we think about rewarding Q as interchangeable, at least in notation here, then we know what the solution is to this problem. Our optimal value will be a soft max of these Q values. And indeed, if you work through the math, you'll get that VK will be a soft max of these Q values. Sharpness of the soft max determined by the temperature parameter beta. And then the policy will be similarly this soft max policy over the Q values. And so what we see is we started from this idea that we want to introduce a distribution over possible solutions. And we saw we could bring an incentive for not just looking at the max by adding an entropy term in the objective. When we work through the math, we get this very intuitive solution that the policy becomes the soft max over Q values. And as we do value iteration updates, the value for VK is a soft max over the Q values. Q values defined above here are reward plus value with one less step to go. 
we now have also covered max end value iteration, which intuitively lines up very well with the original value iteration, but of course introduces this stochasticity in the policies, which later we'll see can help us in things like exploration. All right, so that's it for lecture one. We looked at the motivation, why DeepRL is such an exciting space to be working in and to learn about. We looked at market decision processes, which is the formal framework underlying reinforcement learning methods. We looked at two exact solution methods for the traditional MDP formulation, value iteration and policy iteration. And then we looked at the max end formulation, which effectively turns it into a soft max iteration under the hood compared to what we had in regular value iteration and policy iteration. Now, of course, what we saw so far is great for small MDPs where we can have a loop over all states, all actions, and do the Bellman updates, either hard maxes or soft maxes. But most practical MDPs will have a very large number of states where it's completely impractical to loop over all states and actions. And so the remainder of these lectures in the series will have us look at how we can deal with that, building on the foundations we already covered.